Okay. Okay. Official. So I'll briefly introduce us. Jean, is anything else That's it. that you had to cover? Okay. So I will jump in and briefly introduce who we are. We are Empower with Moxie, an organization dedicated to all things embryo donation. And we provide education, support services, and now matching and journey management for embryo donation. Um, we just soft launched our embryo donation matching platform called Moxie Matching, which we can talk a little bit more about later. Um, and you can also learn more about that at our website. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Maya. I'm a co-founder of Empower and a psychotherapist in the field of reproductive medicine. And I'm a parent via embryo donation. I have a now eight-year-old daughter. And I'm presenting today with one of my partners, Gina, who is also a co-founder of Empower. Gina is a genetic counselor. She's the mother of two children via IVF, and she's an embryo donor. She donated her many remaining embryos to two different recipients so far, and there is one child who's been born from her embryos. Great. Thank you, Maya. Yes. Um, all right, so I'm going to get started. Um, making meaning of shared genetics means exploring your mental models of genetics and family, and maybe, and maybe helping others do it too, because there are a lot of other people that are involved in our lives and our fertility journeys, um, and that will, it will impact all of us. We can think of genetics in the purely biological sense of the word, conceptualizing the actual DNA strand and its job in our body. This can be pretty mechanical, a sort of medical appreciation. Or we can think of genetics in the sense that it unites us to others, connects us to other stories, and how those people have navigated this world with a similar blueprint to ours. When you're at the beginning of a family building journey that might involve embryo or gamete donation, it can be really helpful to examine where those mental models come from and what they're good for. They can be just different lenses you can use at different times and for different reasons. Exploring how these lenses now can help you with your mental health and the confidence you can take with you into parenting. And doing this work will set you up to have authentic conversations about genetics with your child or children into the future. But the conversations and the mental models are very different. So the first half, of, so for the first half of this talk, we're going to go um, more, uh, you know, more into the medical model of genetics and what it means to make meaning of family building with others' genetics. And in the second half of this talk, Maya is going to talk more about the social and emotional model of genetics and the work you're doing as a parent when building a family through embryo or gamete donation. Okay, so first we're talking a little bit about the medical model, you know, DNA as the instruction manual for your body. Um, and we're just going to try that on kind of as a lens to look at genetics. If you think about your body, it really is an amazing thing. It's made up of tiny cells that kind of function in specialized machines. Your brain cells help you think, your eye cells help you to see, and your stomach cells help you to digest your food. But inside every one of these cells is a copy of an instruction manual. And that instruction manual is called DNA and is made of the thousands of genes that tell your body how to develop and function. And genes are like sentences from the instruction manual that we have to follow step by step. Each of our cell cells follows the instructions in their own part of the instruction manual. So brain cells will use genes that are specifically upregulated in the brain, and stomach cells will use, will use genes that are specifically upregulated in the stomach. But we have to keep in mind that DNA is only part of the story. If the DNA is an instruction manual to make your body function, epigenetic information is a highlighted and annotated version of the text. Epigenetics is how our environment affects our genetic programming. Epigenetics determines which genes are transcribed and translated in which cells. And these mechanisms act like dimmer switches on a light bulb. They are the mechanisms our bodies use to get in sync with our environment. And of course, we are all unique because we get our very own instruction manual in our cells. And it's important to honor that a lot of uh, honor that a lot of things, but not everything about us, is related to our instruction instruction manual or the DNA that made us. It ranges from what we look like to silly things, like whether we can roll our tongue or if cilantro tastes good. And it maybe even has something to do with what we like to do with our free time. A lot of time, it's a combination of what's in our DNA and the way we choose to live our lives that makes us uniquely us. 
And your child's DNA is one part of their story, of course, but it's really an incomplete story because it's also what they do with their DNA that counts, the different foods they eat, the different things they do when they're, when they're playing, the things they read or hear or create will help us tailor how they use, will help them tailor how they use their instruction manual. And the picture is really incomplete without those epigenetic marks. The bookmarking and highlighting turns a muted picture up to full color. Epigenetics are important during pregnancy as evidenced by things like good prenatal care and nutrition and how they affect long-term outcomes of children. We know these things about some specific, specific pregnancy outcomes, but it's still a bit of a mystery about how the maternal environment and pregnancy will shape a child's life in more specific ways. But also I like to point out something for those recipients who are trying to make sense of how their family and home environment will uniquely set their child up for their unique life because epigenetics never ends. So the things you expose your child to, the household you raise your child in, child in, what your child enjoys doing, all of this and into the future forever will affect the way the genes are expressed. And you, you know, really have a different kid in front of you than you would have if they were being raised in a different home. The reality is that the question is never as simple as nature versus nurture. It's nature and nurture. The totality of who we are is because of both, not one or the other. Both are extremely influential. Now, I want to turn this to how your medical providers might conceptualize your child's total health picture. How can you feel as a parent empowered in a medical setting? When you walk into a medical setting, it's really important to remember that the things they will be thinking about and how they're doing their job so that they can collect the best information and help your, you manage your child's health. And then later for your child to manage their own health. They might or might not be very knowledgeable about gamete or embryo donation. And sometimes the questions they ask about family history and your family life will be confusing. Both genetic and lifestyle influences can be important for various reasons. And so being upfront about what you know of the genetic family can be important, but also clarifying the intent of their question when they ask is important so that you're giving the right information. And genetics can be a factor throughout the lifespan. So I wanna give you a bit of a sneak peek into what this can look like so you can feel prepared to talk to healthcare providers about your family and your child's genetic picture in the future. At preconception and prenatally, this could mean factoring in the different family history risk that comes from the donor side, the donor's ages, and what testing might be appropriate in this context. During infancy and childhood, it's alerting your pediatrician that the genetic family history is different than your own. One thing, and this is a little bit of a tangent, so if, if I'm losing you, it's okay. Um, we can talk more about this, but one thing that a lot of people don't know is that getting incorrect family history details out of the medical record can be a lifetime battle. I know this because my mom thought I was allergic to penicillin when I was a kid, and it still is following me. I'm almost 44. Um, it can be a lifetime battle to, you know, change something that was incorrect in the family record or in the medical record. Um, and the family history that's noted in the chart will affect the way that doctors think about the differential diagnosis. Essentially, they're using an algorithm to troubleshoot health issues, and this algorithm needs good data. And then I think this could be a bigger issue over time as our systems rely, you know, start to rely more on AI. And so having incorrect information could leave, lead to longer wait times until doctors are able to give your child a diagnosis. So, um, and while there's good people working on this to change the medical system, um, it's taking a while for the medical system to catch up on diverse family forms. So being an advocate for your child is really important in these pediatric years. Okay. So um, later, I'm going to skip now to teens and puberty. Um, teens and, in, in teens and, adult, and early adulthood, that conversation might be more about expectations, you know, kind of as their child grows uh, to an adult and your child taking control of their own health care. And then they could, they could turn to have more questions in their own reproductive years when they're talking about having children and what genetic risk factors might be present for them. Another area of health care that's rapidly changing is adult medicine. We have a better understanding of the genome now and cheaper and more available tests to identify high risk mutations that might enable better preventive health care. And there are some highly actionable genes that might affect somewhere between three and 15% of the population. And I expect these tests to make their way into clinical care in the next few years. For the vast majority of people, the impact of genetics might be a bit more modest, maybe a, a tweaking of their personal health plan here or there based on family history. And by the time our kids are adults or in midlife, the business of healthcare could be 
completely different. I mean, it could look very, very different. Um, it's possible their health is much more tailored and personalized to their genetics than we can really predict right now. Um, it's really possible that they could be spitting in a tube and getting better answers about proactive health steps they can take so that they can modify their epigenome to optimize their health and optimize what's going on in their genome. So all of this is important considerations, like when you're thinking about it, but this is all why it's really important to be as clear as you can be with your doctors, your children's doctors about what you know about the genetics so that they can really use their lens and say what, and what do I, they know about the, 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 ep, you know, the epigenetic effects, the environmental effects, so that they can really take in these things when they're caring for your child and in, in, in their, um, in their healthcare. So just one, um, one last slide about the medical side of things. We do have um, a funded genetic counseling study for embryo donation. So if you're currently in a match or you're thinking about it, match in the future, um, we are providing um, this genetic counseling um, for at no charge to you as long as you're willing to be part of a survey. Um, takes like a 10 minutes, but basically where we're going in and collecting the family history in great detail with a genetic counselor that's specialized in this area to talk to you about what, what risk factors do we see so you can give that very best health history to your child's doctor in the future and that you can really be working off the best data and that your child can take advantage of what genomics has to offer in the future. Okay, so with all that, I'm going to turn it over to Maya. So she's going to be talking more about the social emotional model of genetics. Thank you. Am I unmuted? Yes. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the social emotional elements of sharing genetics because I don't quite understand DNA the way Gina does. Um, I, I mean, I, I do, but whenever I hear her speak, I always go, okay, there's a lot that I don't know here. Um, what I do know is that there are a lot of emotional components to embracing embryo donation as a recipient or intended parent. And I, really what we're talking about is what does becoming a parent through embryo donation mean to you? And what does it mean within the context of your own family, extended family, community, and culture? And I want to back up just a bit um, and acknowledge, back up just a bit to somewhere maybe circa 2012 when I was at some kind of bizarre fertility festival or something like that. Um, but I just want to acknowledge the, this emotional experience that I'm talking about. Many of us start our family building process with some, obviously, with some expectations about how it's going to go. And if you're here today considering embryo donation, that may mean that you're at a crossroad where embryo donation um, just might be the next best option. And perhaps there's a gap between your initial expectation and the reality of your situation. That's I found myself swimming in that gap for, for some time as I was trying to figure out how I was going to create a family, essentially. But people really come to embryo donation for different reasons and with different history. Um, but I will say that most people have to take a little time to make sense of how they got to this place and what it might mean to become a parent through embryo donation. For some, this means having to hold feelings of grief and loss in one hand and the possibility and opportunity that embryo donation provides in the other. Embryo donation really is something you have to wrap your head and your heart around. You have to get comfortable with the idea of building a family in a way that may be unexpected and requires embracing the genetics of another. So what is genetic loss? It's a term that's used a lot in gamete donation. I hear it a lot in the community, but I think it's a uniquely individual experience and somewhat hard to define. Um, it's acknowledging that your own genetic contribution or your partner's, if there is one, your partner's genetic contribution will not be present in your baby making efforts. The degree of loss is personal and connected to how you feel or think about genetics. Many people identify this feeling of loss, but they don't always have the words to describe it. So this slide highlights some common themes that I see around genetic loss. But again, if you have something to share or add, please feel free to put it, put your ideas, thoughts in the chat. Um, you can do that now so that other people can see it. And then we can kind of dive into it once we're finished presenting the slides. But, you know, people often need some time and support to grieve the fantasy or the imagined child or family. Many of us do have that fantasy of what our child or our family was going to look or be like. And that fantasy isn't just about physical looks. It can also be about specific qualities or traits we hope to see in our child. There might be an element of family lineage or a conceptualization that we need to share genetics in order to pass certain things down to the next generation. These are, these are assumptions that I hear a lot. 
For some, there may be certain ethnicity or cultural elements that will not exist in a child that doesn't share your genetics. These are all very common feelings, but even with our own genetics, there's no guarantee about what a child might look or be like or what they might inherit. Genetic similarities and differences are present in all families, no matter how they come together. I also hear some different assumptions and fears, fears about parenting. Gina, you can go to the next one, I think. Um, these fears about parenting a child that isn't genetically, who isn't genetically related. The most common are listed on this slide, but again, you know, feel free to add into the chat. But you know, these are these are the most common sort of what ifs that I hear. What if the child doesn't look like me? What if they don't feel like I put mine in quotes? Um, what if we don't bond? What if they reject me? What if there's a medical issue and I don't have genetic information? What if the feeling of genetic grief never goes away? I I personally I I didn't have all of these, but I definitely had some of them because you're dancing with a lot of these unknown factors. And I'm sharing just a few photos out of a ton of um, pictures of my husband and my daughter when she was a baby. And they don't share any genetics, but when I say they look a lot alike, they behave a lot alike, they sound a lot alike, they make the same face, facial expressions, they come at me in the same way sometimes. Um, I, you know, I, a lot of my what ifs have, I don't know, been quieted or just have changed over time. So I think it's really normal and okay to, to think about the what ifs. Um, but the rest of this is going to talk through, okay, what do you do with some of these what ifs? Um, I, I think that we may point to genetics as being the root of these what ifs because genetics is the difference. But genetics or not, these are considerations that all people who are parenting a child have. Each one of us is a unique human on this planet who has relationships with other unique humans. And so there just are a lot of inherently inherent like unknowns in that there. And I, and I always think that if my daughter does reject me in some way, shape or form, which she likely will as a teenager, I don't think that the, it's going to be about genetics. It's going to be about her thinking I'm a jerk of a parent because I won't let her. I don't know pierce her ears or something, although I don't really care about ear piercing, but anyways, but it's, it's, you know, I think sometimes the default is, oh, it must be a genetic thing, or it's because we don't share genetics, but, you know, I think part of this is really expanding the thoughts around that. Okay, so let's, let's do that. What do we do with all of this information? So first, it's important to understand what your genetics means to you. You may have never had to have had to think about this until now. So really try to consider the question, what do genetics mean for me? And I'm going to throw out a handful of questions in this because it's it's food for thought. It's what's it, you can take it home. You can journal about it, whatever is helpful. Um, there are fertility specific therapists in the field that can help support people kind of trying to process some of these these thoughts. But I think it's really important to notice what thoughts come up initially, then ask yourself how true that thought or assumption is. We may be holding on to what I call life rules, things that we believe to be true without question. For example, the idea that family is blood. Where does that come from? Is it true? Is it the only thing that's true? Are we as a society changing the definition of family to be more inclusive? And is that a good thing? Is that something that we personally can embrace? There's no right or wrong answers with any of this. I put this out there as a way to ask yourself questions and see if there's space to expand the perspective. And I talk about that a lot in my private practice. Where, where's there space to, to expand a bit? And does it feel authentic and genuine to rewrite some of those ingrained life rules that we might have? Is it possible to zoom the lens out and focus on what the bigger picture hope or goal is? If it is to be a parent and to have a family, then maybe ask yourself if that desire is more important than genetics. And important might not be the right word, but um, you know we, we do have to make choices. And I think in this moment of having to make a choice, we have to explore all of these thoughts and feelings and kind of make a decision, right? Can we let go of the imagined child and make room for a new narrative? Can we focus on the gain rather than the loss? By taking this alternative route, yes, there may be loss, but is there also gain? Is there a way to shine light on what's going to be gained rather than what's going to be lost? Are we able to redistribute the weight of importance of our genetic contribution versus our parenting contribution? And that's kind of what Gina was hitting on, this nature and nurture combo. It's not nature or nurture necessarily. 
And knowing how uncomfortable it is to sit in the what ifs and unknowns, can we make a plan to prepare or prepare as best that you can for how you may handle some of the what ifs around non-genetic parenting? And lastly, it's this is more of advice, but don't move on until you feel ready. Get support, get counseling, and know that there are ser- therapists, support groups, and different resources to help you if you feel a little stuck in some of these um, thoughts and these sort of emotional tasks of being able to move through in order to get to a place of feeling more confident. So the next slide is one that um, my mentor, she's a clinical psychologist, Elaine Gordon. Um, She often talks about this idea of a leap of faith that people have to take in order to move forward. And I think she's right. It's important to feel a sense of acceptance when embracing embryo donation as a recipient or as intended parent. We can't always change a situation, but we can see if there's room for a shift in perspective. Is there another angle, another lens that we can view our situation from? The truth is there are unknowns about having a child with or without genetic contribution. The question is, can we accept the unknowns and shift any fears we have about them into a curiosity? Can we accept needing some help and get comfortable with others, sometimes strangers, being in the picture? Can we see the situation as something with potential benefits? There are some things we must accept if we're going to move forward with embryo donation. One of those things is that our children will be connected to other people. And how we conceptualize that connection is up to us. And over time, it'll be up to the child. So I just invite people to think about that initial narrative and explore other possibilities that still feel aligned or genuine to who you are. Can some of these differences be interesting and cool to embrace and to talk about? Sometimes in life and in fertility, we have to take a leap of faith and accept a choice or a path and know that we are making the best choice with what's in front of us at the moment that we have to make that choice. So these last five bullet points, um, they can a lot of them can really apply to obviously parenting in general except maybe for like the third and fifth one. But um, we do, we have a webinar and we'll talk a little bit about other resources about um, talking to kids about embryo donation, but parenting a child who doesn't share your genetics, start early and come from a place of honesty and confidence. And I think being able to work through any of these feelings that we've talked about, any of these places where some people get stuck in terms of genetic loss, really giving yourself time to process that and support to process that so that you can come to parenting from a place of confidence Um, and start early, talk about it early with your child. Follow curiosity for what you don't know. I work with a lot of people who've um, gone the unknown, non-directed, anonymous, I put in quotes, route for gamete donation um, because they, there weren't other options for them perhaps, or that just felt like the best fit. And sometimes people feel afraid, well, what if they ask me this and I don't know the answer? It's okay to not know the answer. Follow their curiosity, ask questions. Oh, you're wondering about this and wondering why. Connect, it's all about connecting when it comes to um, talking to kids about these kinds of things. Language, again, we have this webinar that I think is useful. And um, I started with calling my daughter's donors, donor helpers. And we, as she got older, we made kind of like a a family tree project where the donors were the roots. Make it really simple. This is a a growing conversation that happens over time, but you do want to set, set the stage early and allow space for your child to ask questions and for this conversation to grow and develop over time. Respect their nature, provide the nurture. That's obvious that's all parenting and you know for people and this is kind of it would be a whole other bigger conversation but um transracial embryo donation having a child that um is of a different heritage or culture than yours i think that you know there's and we can provide some resources for that as well um but just embracing all heritage and culture yours and theirs making it a collective family you know, with all all different cultures together, it really is about family diversity, and um, and we talk about that a bit in our webinar, and we share some books and resources. But if there anybody has specific questions on those things, let us know, and we'll definitely get those out there. And then I think that's it. We have one more slide that just can direct you back to our website, Empower with Moxie. Again, education, we have a full education platform that's free that you can explore. We have an embryo donation guidebook and other other tools there. 
Our matching platform is called Moxie Matching. Um, right now for recipients, we're collecting interested recipients. We aren't totally live yet on the recipient side, but we are onboarding different donors who are, are really just cool people looking to share their embryos with other people who need them. Um, and we do offer various supports. I, there's also an interest form if you're interested in a recipient support group and collecting just, you know, kind of people who are interested in that so that I can eventually start another group. I had a group not too long ago. Um, and Gina's genetic counseling study is on that part as well. Um, so yeah, reach out to us if you have any thoughts, feelings, and questions. And good, we did the slides in a half hour. I'm going to stop the recording. If I know how, it's the square, right? Yes. Okay. Wait, no, Gina. Okay. <laughs>